We live in a very dynamic world. And as you can see from the uh, satellite image sequences here, um, some of the cyclic behavior of the seasonal progression of snowpack and vegetation is clear. Um, and also some of the random <coughs> behavior associated with wildfires um, can both be represented in, in satellite uh, imagery. And so these present one method of environmental monitoring. There are lots of different types of environmental monitoring, but this is one way we can do it. We can use satellite remote sensing or Earth observation. Now, in terms of the, the goals of environmental monitoring, I'm sure we could all come up with different reasons for why we would do this or um, how we would do this. Um, but there are three elements of monitoring that kind of stand out as being important or compelling for me. Um, first of all, to support wise stewardship. Now, that can mean many different things, but let's just say it's you know look, looking after caring for the environment. Secondly, to identify potential threats. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, if we've got a long-term record whatever it may be, um, whenever we see outlying behavior, that's where strange things start to happen. That's where maybe threats start to emerge. One example might be river, river records. Let's say we have 100 years of river flow records, and uh, we start to see that those records are a, lot, a long way below normal, a long bit way below what we might expect for a certain time of year. Well, maybe the alarm bells might start going off, might be thinking, oh, drought. Or maybe the records start to go higher than we would expect for this time of year. And then we might be starting to th uh, think about floods. So that's one of the things we're looking for. We were trying to identify those potential threats in the record. And then there's this more esoteric term, trying to identify tipping points. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, hopefully, I'm going to draw a few analogies to illustrate what tipping points are. But essentially, it's, it's a change in the state of the environment or the ecosystem or the system that we're observing. So you know, for many, many years, it may exist in a certain state. And then it might transition into another state. So for example, we might go from wetlands to forest. Uh, we might go from a period of no wildfires to a period of lots of wildfires. And where that change occurs is that tipping point. And so environmental monitoring can help us identify uh, threats and tipping points in our environment. Now, I've illustrated here um, Earth observation, or satellite remote sensing methods of, of observing the world around us. Um, but the technology we're going to focus on today is, is airborne LIDAR. And it's fundamentally different uh, in many respects to uh, satellite uh, observations. But, but the main area of difference is that it's fundamentally a three-dimensional data source. As you can see from this image of the, the West Castle area, or the, the Castle Ski Hill, which I'm sure many of you have enjoyed, um, you can see we're actually looking at the, the relief or the morphology of this landscape, and we're simultaneously mapping the terrain or the elevation and the vegetation cover. And so this is what I'm going to, or the, the main message of this talk, is essentially that this is an underutilized um, monitoring resource. And so I'm trying to advocate for a greater use of this technology. Now, at this point, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my own reason for being in Canada. Um, in 1995, at the end of my undergraduate, uh, I really didn't know where to go. My life was kind of open to anything and open to suggestion. Uh, I'd actually applied to join the Royal Air Force. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I sat down with my undergraduate thesis advisor at the end of my degree, and uh, I could tell from his furrowed expression on his face that he didn't think that was such a great idea. I just spent four field seasons in the Swiss Alps and, and the French Alps, learned a lot about glasses, a lot about water resources, and he said, you know, you should, really should exploit this, this knowledge. So he suggested that I, that I go to Canada uh, and uh, conduct graduate research on using these skills on, in glacial hydrology and mountain hydrology and applying them to the problem of understanding how glacial recession over the long term was impacting runoff, <coughs> both in terms of water resources but also in terms of flood hazards. Because that's one thing we know is that there's a lot of meltwater coming off those them there mountains and glaciers. It's all going into the rivers. But if they're disappearing, what's that going to do for the water resource? <laughs> now, I had lots of data at my disposal, long-term runoff records, uh, occasional points of data for precipitation and snowpack, uh, and uh, aerial photography going back to the 50s, and a lot of field data. Um, but the challenge was it was kind of like a, a smorgasbord of data in all different locations at different points of time, and I really didn't know how to put all of this data together. Um, one illustration of the problems is this is the Pato Glacier. Many of you have, will have seen Pato, maybe even hiked or skied over there, uh, about 50 kilometers north of Lake Louise, uh, off of the Icefields Parkway. And this is a, a federal research monitoring site, and it has been since the 60s. But it's one of only two in Alberta. And in fact, it's the only one that's got a continuous record um, since the 60s. 
And so this creates a bit of a challenge. If we're trying to understand glasses and their impact on runoff over a very large area, we're going to extrapolate from one point. Now, uh, I should mention that uh, maybe from a mountain water resources point of view, what's more important is snowpack. And so this, this problem of, uh, of extrapolating from one point to a very large area, you know, a drainage basin, is even more prevalent with our snowpack data because every year this, is the, this represents the lion's share of our water resource. Uh, particularly here in southern Alberta, most of our water comes from snowpack. Uh, not, very, uh, not much of it comes from glacial melt anymore. In the past, a lot more would have done. To the north, more glacial melt. But in this part of the uh, country, snow melt is extremely important to our overall annual runoff. And this is because we're so close to the mountainous, uh, uh, the mountains where the snowpack is uh, quite deep. Can now, you stay with the mic? People in the room can hear you. If you want to stay with the mic, can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> now, um, so this record is not from the mountains. This is a, a, a snow course or snow depth record from some part, uh, some area in the north of, uh, north of Canada. And it doesn't really matter where it is. It's, it's to serve a, an illustrative point. But it's in an environment where we're seeing very rapid changes in the environment. And in fact, an environment that has undergone a tipping point, where we've changed from one condition into a new condition. And, and this is somewhat represented in the snowpack record. Now, if you look at the blue line, this represents the historical snow depth through time over, over a decade or so of data collected in the 70s. And so you can see snow depth increases around midwinter and then it drops off in the spring. Now if we look at the more recent decade in the 2000s, we can see the snowpack starts to accumulate later and it's lost earlier. Uh, the difference in magnitude doesn't change very much, but the time duration of snowpack coverage is reduced. Um, and also if we look here, the time over which the snowpack melts is also reduced. So immediately we should start thinking, oh, well, if that happens, maybe floods are more likely, maybe they could occur earlier. I'm not saying they are, but that is a possibility if you interpret uh, uh, this, this graphic. Now, to think of tipping points. 1998, the, the one year 1998 is represented here because that was an extremely strange year from a climatological standpoint. Some of you may recall this was, it was a big El Nino year uh, and what that meant was very little snowpack overall and, uh, and even though this is northern Canada, th that was the same thing was true here, very little snowpack, lots of glacial melt, a very dry summer and if we go out to the east in Quebec of course the ice storms. It was a very, very uh, strange year. And so in this environment, it created a bit of a tipping point. We went from a, a one condition to another condition, and we haven't gone back to those former conditions. Uh, okay, so this illustrates that long-term records uh, are very important. Without the long-term records, we wouldn't be able to identify that these changes had occurred or that our water resources might be changing through time. Now, I'd like to bring in a, a, a slight uh, personal anecdote here and kind of relate this concept of a tipping point to a human life. And in my case, uh, this relates to uh, something that happened in uh, 1998 into 1999, ironically around about that El Nino time, but it wasn't directly related to that. Um, here I was sat in my office in, uh, in Ontario working on my PhD research and got a phone call completely out of the blue from a PhD student uh, in, the, in the United States. Apparently, he'd found out that he and I were doing very similar research, except mine was in the Canadian Rockies and his was in the Peruvian Andes. Immediately, I was intrigued by this because another mountain environment sounded really cool, so we chatted for a little while. Eventually, he said, hey, you know what, why don't you come and spend a month with me down in Peru? And I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to learn about, you know, the kind of phenomena that I'm studying in Canada, but in a very different environment. And so, um, and so it was that, you know, I traveled to Peru uh, over the New Year's of 98 into 99, and we spent a month just traveling around the, from the lofty summits of the Cordillera Blanca down to the desert shorelines on the Pacific Ocean. We spent those whole months just exploring and trying to, you know, soaking up all of this new experience and knowledge, all within a water resources context. And one of the things that really stood out for me was that everywhere, it was, the, the importance of water was so uh, obvious. Now, it's important to us too, but we're in a much more engineered environment. You know, we've got pipelines underground. We don't necessarily see a lot of the hydrological water resources infrastructure. 
Um, but in these environments, there were a lot of ad hoc diversions, or people putting pipelines to divert the water into a cistern for their house. You know, things that we don't see so much in this environment. And it struck me that all, a lot of this infrastructure is very flimsy. And, and in this photograph, you can see we're, we're hiking in a village in the mountains, and we've got this ad hoc uh, ditching, and we've got some pipes just kind of laying about. And in other environments, we've got, we, we'd see these pipes diverting water into a, into a cistern. And I don't have a lot of photographs, but this one kind of somewhat illustrates this point. But um, more of an eye-opener for me was that, uh, again, while we're on our travels in this environment, I remember seeing this, this steel drum just perched on this concrete platform. And uh, at the time, I wasn't sure what that was. I was half filled with water, had about an inch of thick oil on the top of it. It was just a weird thing. And so I asked Brian. Uh, Brian was the PhD student in the States. And he explained to me, well, this is one of the very few precipitation monitoring points in the whole Cordillera Blanca. And so immediately I thought, well, hang on, I, I'm dealing with these problems of you know, very limited data in the Canadian Rockies. But relatively speaking, we're dealing with a much more dynamic environment and far fewer data points, much less data to deal with in the Peruvian Andes. So I, I immediately realized, wow, they've got much bigger challenges than we have in the Rockies. And so that was kind of the start of my tipping point, this realization of the importance of monitoring data. And now, fast forward a few days, uh, and now further to the south, we're in that coastal environment, in a more desert-type environment in, uh, in Peru. And uh, we awoke from our hostel um, uh, beds to the rumbling of floodwaters outside. The rivers were overbank, uh, overtopping their banks, and we've got uh, houses were, uh, and uh, gas stations were inundated. Uh, and this was a total surprise. It was a surprise to us, and it was a surprise to the people in the community. And it illustrated to me how uh, the lack of monitoring infrastructure, the lack of early warning systems, meant that this kind of event could happen, and you wouldn't know about it. You would know about it because there's water entering into your house, and it's flooding. And it could be raining, it could be snow melt, it could be glacial melt, all happening you know, hundreds of kilometers upstream, but you wouldn't know about it. There was no, no infrastructure in place. And so again, this, this, this um, illustrated to me the importance of monitoring. Now, of course, this is not something that we're completely unaware of. Floods are something, you know, they happen in Alberta. We all remember 2013 and the massive floods that happened in, uh, in Calgary and, and on the Bow River and the various tributaries around there. It was a massive event, devastating event. And at the time, it was one of the most uh, costly events in Canadian history. I think at the time, it probably was. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it really brought home that in Alberta, floods can be a problem. However, let's face it, here in this part of Alberta, we probably tend to think more about droughts as being the bigger water resource problem or threat than floods. Um, you know, we, we live on the edge of the Palliser Triangle, and so we have this preoccupation, you know, it's a very dry environment, preoccupation that, uh, that, that we could have a drought, and uh, that this could have very deleterious impacts on, the, on our ecosystems or on our agricultural crops, therefore our economy, food security. So these are the issues that are, are important to us in this part of the world. Okay, now full disclosure, these are not cottonwoods on the banks of the Old Man River. These are eucalyptus trees uh, around the edge of a wetland complex in southeastern Australia. Very different environment. Um, but, uh, but I put them here because uh, these illustrate what, what can happen. You know, uh, an entire community of mature trees decimated, all dead, as a result of a prolonged 10-year drought uh, from the end of the 90s into the early 2000s, again, in, in southeastern Australia. Now, this seems unimaginable here in southern Alberta, but think about it. With all of glacial recession, that's kind of our long-term water, water storage may disappear. Uh, add to that a few years of very limited snowpack, and it's not inconceivable that a situation like this could happen in this part of the world. Okay, now while we're on the topic of hot and dry weather, uh, let's quickly turn to uh, wildfires. I know, that's a rather awkward segue. Um, but uh, as the Keno fire illustrates, uh, and this isn't Keno, this is, a, this is actually Jasper National Park, but uh, as these fires illustrate, we can have massive losses of property um, and uh, you know, massive emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, loss of life, uh, loss of property, loss of uh, tourism resources. And so combined with the water resource issue, it should be important that forests 
and water are vital resources, vital natural resources to the, to the Albertan economy. And so, you know, how do we monitor these things? Well, I'm not going to lecture on all the different ways that we monitor these resources. There, there are various methods. Um, but uh, I would like to stress that there is one common element that they all possess, and that is dimensionality. Whether it is snowpack depth, or glacial area, glacial volume, or timber volume, or even floodplain carrying capacity, these are all measurable uh, uh, attributes of the landscape. And so, uh, what I am going to advocate for uh, is that uh, airborne LIDAR, kind of a three-dimensional monitoring technology, is a very good tool for doing that kind of monitoring. Now, in, in uh, the same year, 1999, I came back from Peru and was broke and uh, had to uh, suddenly think about my financial situation. A friend of mine had gotten a job with a company that um, manufactured this laser technology. And so I uh, applied for a job there at the end of my PhD and, and was lucky and learned all about this fascinating technology. And as you can see from this, this uh, animation here, essentially an air airplane flies across the landscape, emits hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of laser pulses at the Earth's surface, records the reflections, and from that we can generate a three-dimensional model of the terrain and the vegetation. That's as technical as I'll get when it comes to LIDAR. OK, so here I was, end of 99, learned about this technology, newfound appreciation for monitoring inadequacies in mountainous environments. And kind of putting these two things together, I was really excited because I saw a lot of potential. So I wanted to communicate this to the research network that funded my research, aptly named Crisis, although it was Cryospheric Systems in Canada. So uh, a few months down the road was a conference in Winnipeg in 2000, February 2000, and so I, I um, was determined to go to this conference and present on how this new 3D monitoring technology could potentially help with monitoring these, these environments. I was convinced that this was going to uh, be kind of the, the completion of that tipping point in my own life and um, transition into uh, a, a new direction for me. Well, it did. This meeting actually did, but not in the way I imagined. Uh, at the meeting, I met this young master student, Laura Chasma, and she was uh, studying Arctic sea ice at the time. But like me, she became convinced that uh, LIDAR was a transformative technology, and then she pursued a PhD in uh, forest uh, carbon research. And so, in the interest of time, I'll hand straight over to Laura so she can tell you all about forests. Thanks, Chris. So, as Chris mentioned, uh, we're intensely interested in LIDAR, and we've been collecting LIDAR data in Alberta since the early 2000s. Uh, a number of our data collections have also been of areas of, of the modified oil sands region where we're interested in studying the changing wetland and forest environments. Uh, in these areas, we have a number of meteorological towers and, and well data where we can actually see the long-term changes. And if you look at the whole part of Western Canada, what we can see is that the climate is, is warming up in central and eastern Alberta and it's also drying. Okay. So uh, this has had an interesting effect on wetlands, especially in central Alberta. My colleagues at the University of Alberta and the University of Waterloo have been observing drying periods for quite some time. And this isn't to say that these wetlands are always dry, but certainly we're seeing more and more frequent drying periods than we used to. So using LIDAR data, we can quantify the changes in vegetation beyond the photographs and beyond observations by looking at this full three-dimensional structure of the vegetation. Here we see uh, a point cloud of laser pulse reflections from a tree and shrub foliage canopy which appear in this image white. We can also see the ground surface which are green and we can even see the, the top of the water which is blue. So we can, in this image, we can see almost every part of the structure of the vegetation. We can see the branches, the distribution of the leaves, the height of the trees and shrubs, and even their shape. So imagine that. You know, there is no other type of remote sensing technology where we can get that full three-dimensional structure. And in fact, we couldn't even measure this out in the field if we were to put plot measure, measurements out there. 
So over time, using multiple LiDAR data sets collected over the same area, we can calculate the differences in the height, in the foliage cover, and the shape of these trees by simply looking at the rates of change of, for example, vegetation height. So here, you know, with regards to the wetland environment that we were studying in the oil sands region in central Alberta, um, we know that this area has been drying out quite substantially over the last 13 years. Here are uh, three pond areas that you can see in black, and you can see the wetlands around them in brown. And then you can also see kind of the, um, the transition area between the forests here and the wetland environment shown as, as the, um, in various colors from orange all the way up to turquoise. So what we've done here is we've actually taken the height information that we collected from the LiDAR data in 2002 and we um, were able to outline those shrub areas or the riparian areas uh, as shown here. Now in 2015, if we overlay the 2015 image on there, we can see the amount of change that has occurred over that 13 period, year, year period. And I want you to keep an eye on how these shrubs have encroached here. So this is only over 13 years and we can see some, such substantial changes. Now ecosystems have been changing, you know, from, from millennia since the dawn of time. But what we're seeing here is that the changes that are occurring have never happened so quickly in the recent period of our, our rigorous scientific measurements. So from this, we can quantify the changes at, over every meter of ground surface and over thousands of wetland and forested environments. So while we were seeing these changes, our colleagues at the University of Alberta and University of uh, Waterloo were setting up water wells, which you can see here, and meteorological stations. And in fact, at U of A, they've set up over 200 water wells. And at UW, we've set up over 16 weather stations. Now these can be very time consuming to set up and they're very, very expensive, but it allows us to see and compare the changes in the meteorology and the hydrology with the changes that we're seeing in the vegetation structures. So that was quite interesting, except that we had a problem. In 2011, the wildfire from uh, the town of Slave Lake moved north and into our field site and it actually burned down a number of our, of our weather stations. So what we were seeing was that the changes in the peatlands that were occurring, this drying out and this shrubification, was actually making the peatlands more sensitive to wildfire and more of these areas were burning. Okay, so to give you an idea, these areas um, these peatland areas and wetland areas are very important in Alberta. Wetlands cover about 20% of the land surface area and 90% of these are peatlands. So this is what a, a peatland looks like. And these contain wet soils that promote the development of a thick organic layer of sphagnum and, and organic moss that can take thousands of years to develop. They've also been largely resilient to wildfire. Um, because they, they're basically moist, so they just don't burn. Now when you think of peatlands, this is what you often think of, but these environments are incredibly important because they act like sponges on the landscape. They basically absorb the water when it's wet, and then they nourish the surrounding forested environments when it's dry. So because some of these peatlands are drying, what we're finding is that it's causing them to smolder and burn for a prolonged period of time. And um, what's happening is that a lot of that organic layer is combusting. And this can contribute up to 90% of the carbon emissions that we're seeing. So using time series LiDAR data, we can start to map the amount of loss of biomass and the depth of burn and the carbon loss over these large areas. So here we can see the, the depth of burn and what is going to happen to the future of these ecosystems and how they'll regenerate out of, over time. Now this is really important because in Canada, wildfires have been burning more and more areas. Uh, you can see here the extent of wildfires since the 1980s 
And we spend approximately $600 million on wildfire every year. Now the problem with this is that we're also seeing that wildfire areas are doubling in size and have doubled since the 1970s are expected to double in the next 10 to 20 years. So what happened to our weather stations out at Lake Utigma? Well, we rebuilt some of them and we also moved some of them to another place where we figured it wouldn't burn. I don't know if you recognize that, but that's Fort McMurray and those are our, our new sites. So that was in 2012. But in 2016, when the Horse River wildfire went through, we weren't too happy about the whole situation and certainly the people and loss of house and property. But I'm not going to tell you what the folks at Waterloo said of the loss of their weather stations, but it was certainly a little bit more explicit than, oh, for Pete's sake. <laughs> so now we're, we're working on wild, wildfires and we're actually searching for areas that have burned in the future. So we can map these changes, especially around urban areas, and we can look for other areas that have burned more recently. So this brings us to the Waterton and the Kino fire. We're actively searching for those. Okay, so I'll leave it to Chris now. We're working on fast transitions, trying to keep the time. So we're gonna segue now from Waterton and the Kino fire to uh, a few hundred kilometers to the north, now we're in Banff, Jas uh, Banff National Park, and we're looking at the glacial loss. So here we're now just starting to see some of the results of LIDAR monitoring. This is uh, an, an animation of a number of LIDAR images stacked one on top of the other and looking at the differences between them. And so what we can see is the vertical depth of down wasting or glacial melt over this 10 year period. And so during this time period I think we have seven images. Uh, to date we've collected eight or nine uh, data sets over the Pato. And so we can see uh, approximately four meters of loss, vertical loss, in the uh, terminus zone uh, over that uh, decade. Now, it's interesting if we look at these environments adjacent to the edge of the glacier, these are what we call the, the, the periglacial environment around the edge of the glacial extent. And so we're seeing losses in these areas too. Now, if we zoom in on that and look at another animation, this is just looking at a, at a shaded relief or a hill shade image. So we're just looking at the three-dimensionality of that landscape. And we can see that as... I can't hear you. You really don't understand the light. As the toe of the glacier recedes about 300 meters over that time period, we're also seeing the, uh, the moraines on the edge of the glacier kind of uh, shrinking or sliding into the edge of the glacier at a rate of about five meters per year. So that's a very, very dynamic environment. Now, okay, this all looks cool and everything gives us a sense of what's happening in this environment, but what does this mean in terms of water resources? Now, I mentioned earlier that I had aerial photogrammetry as well, uh, but the, it was kind of challenging to do really accurate photogrammetric analysis without a lot of control data. The LIDAR, fortunately, provides us one way to control and correct the airborne photo data. So in so doing, by combining these data sets, we can actually go all the way back to 1949 and recreate uh, volumetric or surface profiles of the glacial change over this time period. So uh, here you can see the change in extent from 49 up to, in this case, 2010. And here we can see some profiles across the glacier terminus area and uh, a longitudinal profile along the length of the glacier.